Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 91 of Glass to the Wall. I'm Neil Flynn, and this is the rest of the Cubed 3 team. Luke Hemming. Hello. Mike McCann. Hello. And Sandy Wilson. Nice to meet you. And we're here today to talk to you about three major topics, and that will be cloud streaming, Nintendo's demos, and abuse within the gaming industry when it comes to Cyberpunk's uh, delay. But first, let's get on to our first topic, the top of the show, and that is the cloud streaming. Now, earlier this week at the Nintendo Direct, Nintendo have announced, or sorry, Nintendo's Partnership Direct, have announced uh, two games that will be available for cloud streaming. That's Control and Hitman 3. Now, when it comes to cloud streaming, it's a bit interesting because you don't necessarily own the game. And instead, what you're actually buying when you buy Control for Nintendo Switch is the permission to stream it via a Taiwanese-based technology company called Ubitus. Ubitus? <laughs> Essentially, you're buying a ticket to the server, which also means that you have to wait in line and to actually get in. Once you're able to stream control, uh, you'll find you're able to play the game via a Wi-Fi connection, uh, but you even have the option to access a version of the game that supports ray tracing visuals running at 30 frames per second, and that was from Den of Geek. Um, now, guys, everybody here, I think everybody here has played it. Do you think this can challenge the next-gen uh, consoles with uh, streaming starting to become the norm? Luke, is this something that you think is a, a viable option for the Nintendo Switch going into uh, next-gen? Yeah, definitely. Um, I wouldn't say that it's going to challenge the next-gen consoles, but I think Nintendo once again made sure they've got their little slice of the pie when it comes to the new stuff. Um, yeah, the streaming works, the technology works, and it's a great workaround for what they're already offering so i think don't think people are going to stray away from the next gen consoles but if they've got a switch i think they're certainly going to stick with it and try this new technology yeah and <laughs> speaking of technology obviously uh we're all in different parts of the uk which are some are a little bit more technologically challenged than others <laughs> does the internet element of it work for you guys uh mike i know that uh sometimes internet could be a bit of an issue in, in parts of, of the UK or other parts of the world. Have you tried playing it? Does it stream well for you? Uh, yeah, I gave it a go. Um, and it, it sort of works as a proof of uh, concept. Um, my internet speed, I think, is around like 70 meg. Um, and it wasn't, it still stuttered on that, you know what I mean? It's not the greatest, not the worst, but, uh, um, but I still had a, a few technical hitches, which didn't quite convince me that it's the greatest way to go for myself anyway um so uh, and, do, and, do, and do you think it can sort of create that step for nintendo just to uh to sort of uh bridge the gap between next gen and and what's available on their platform at the moment yeah it's an interesting take on streaming isn't it because uh i like i keep wondering if it's a better incentive for third-party publishers rather than like a licensing deal for streaming services so I'm wondering if that's why they're going that kind of route to try and coax bigger AAA kind of um, third-party games onto their platform. Mm. Um, but I also, I'm not convinced that it's like an ideal solution yet, obviously, because, I mean, I had trouble streaming with it. Um, I'm also kind of, you know, I'm not sure about paying full price for a cloud version of a game, which you don't have any ownership of. So that's another issue as well for me. Yeah, well, we'll get on to price in a moment, actually. But Sandy, uh, Resident Evil Seven uh, came out the cloud version in Japan, and that was a it was an option back then. You know, that was a relatively newish game coming, and now we've got Hitman Three and Control games from from last year, I believe. Um, is this something that you think is a viable option going forward for the next two, three, four years to bridge the gap? I think it certainly opens up a lot of doors for games that the Nintendo Switch could never run, such as Control. Um, but I feel like maybe the technology needs a bit more time to bed in. Like, Control, the experience I had was it was fairly smooth. First time playing it, I crashed out of the server maybe two, three minutes in. Uh, but the second one, I managed to run through the entire sort of trial time, even got some combat, which was surprising. Um, and, I mean, the experience was okay I, I i do wonder if capcom's streaming for resident evil was more stable than that it'd be interesting to find out from a japanese person how that 
that itself ran as well in comparison. Mm. Yeah, and just uh, touching on what Mike just said there, really, and, and we'll go around in terms of a discussion of is thirty nine or thirty four ninety nine, sorry, thirty four pound ninety nine pence. Is that too much to gain access to the server, Luke? Do you, what do you think is a more reasonable price, if if or if that's already won? No, it's it's maximum eleven ninety nine, I reckon. Um, very specific, but I've got <laughs> I've got my uh, I've got my boundaries. Um, mm -hmm. Like Mike said, thirty four ninety nine for a game you technically don't own, I think, is too much. But maybe thirty four ninety nine for a lot more on offer. Maybe if they can work something with other developers and say we can offer you this package for thirty four ninety nine. Then maybe I'd be more tempted. Yeah. Now, just to confirm that thirty four ninety nine and the big controversy is controversy is here is that once uh, they want to turn off the servers, they have to give you, or they don't even have to, but they said they would give you a six month notice period, and then it's gone. Now, <laughs> Mike, you didn't want to pay thirty four ninety nine in the first place. Uh, what's a more viable solution for this, knowing that you might not have access to the game in the future? Uh, they could charge eleven ninety nine, like Luke said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, more seriously, uh, it does sort of make the, the, the streaming options like XCloud and Stadia, for me personally, look like more of a tantalizing option. I'd rather pay a subscription if I'm not going to own something and lose it as part of the platform. You know, I'm either on the platform or I'm not on the platform. Yeah. Uh, but with this cloud cloud way of doing it, it kind of does feel a bit impermanent, you know, as well. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, so I don't know what what would what would entice me. Yeah, if they threw it in, if they threw it in as a package, it would be great. But it's a tough sell. Yeah, and Sandy, I can see you agreeing as well. So eleven ninety nine seems to be consensus <laughs> consensus price. But I think you were nodding at the subscription model. Um, um, you know. Is that something that you could see in, instead, perhaps, coming, you know, a more EA Play, Game Pass-style uh, subscription model coming out from Nintendo for cloud-based gaming? I think it would certainly be a much better prospect for the customer. Um, obviously, I mean, Control Complete Edition, I think, launch, or, or did launch or went to £35 fairly quickly. Um, on the other platforms that exist at the moment. So I can see where they might have grabbed that price from and where they think it might be okay. But I think the fact that you're paying £35 for a ticket for a server that's somewhere else in the world that's running this game just now, that might get repurposed in the future. I mean, it's a bit much. I was thinking between 10 and £15, so... That seems to be the consensus. Lem Lem yeah. Um But yeah, certainly when Game Pass is a sort of a hundred games at a time for your your thirty pounds a month or whatever, thirty five for a single game on Nintendo's platform seems pretty harsh. Do you think there's an easier solution here? And it's something that I think people have mooted before. It's not exactly brand new, but just put Game Pass on Switch. Is that something? Do you think Microsoft? could potentially do i mean it, control for all purposes you know uh, from my play test and by the sounds of it your play test it does seem to work competently enough i think going back to the ownership issue of you know if you've paid 34.99 and you can't get onto the server it's booting you off or you have to restart the game here and there that gets quite frustrating but if it is a subscription model for some reason i, some, I think there might be a bit more lenience to uh, getting booted off or having connection issues if it only happens from here or now and again mainly because you can boot into another game, but do you think if they just put Game Pass on Switch, is that something that you'd prefer to see? Sandy? <laughs> I, I would definitely use it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I have any other comments. I would use it. Well, it seems like a good plan. <laughs> I guess it would obviously extend the Microsoft exclusives range to the Nintendo platform, which might be something that they're too interested in doing, but we've seen, you know, Microsoft actually put out their idea of what they would have as a slice of the pie. And they say, you know, by the fact that they're attacking PC, console, and mobile, they've cornered 75% of the market or something like this. If they take in Nintendo's slice of the pie, you know, you, you're all of a sudden probably up to at least about another 80, 85%.
just leaving PlayStation behind in the dust. Um, well, okay, let's let's move the Game Pass element to the side for a second then. If you were to see any other cloud-based games being streamed or you think that should come to the Switch in, in such fashion, then what should it be, Luke? Are there any other AAA titles that are either coming out this year or next year uh, that you think should deserve the same treatment? Um, well, I know I'm probably going to steal this from Mike by saying Cyberpunk, but um, Demon Souls, okay. like that, that looks fantastic on the PS5. PlayStation 5 exclusive. <laughs> yeah, this is the issue. Um, I don't see any reason for Valhalla not to be on there either than the Assassin's Creed. Mm. That could stream down simply enough, I think. That those would be the titles that would get me more interested. But again, it's that price bracket that is keeping me away at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, if they started releasing some titles at eleven ninety nine, then Mike, what titles would you like to see <laughs> uh, be sort of a cloud ported to Switch? Uh, yeah. Well, it's hard to say if they'd be releasing many of the games. I'd say they'd want to entice over onto the Switch. For eleven ninety nine for cloud streaming, um, because any of the ones that they could charge eleven ninety nine for would be on the store for download for eleven ninety nine. You know, ga- I'm thinking of games like Akami, older games like that, which you can download anyway, and there's the option there. Um, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think I just have to repeat what Luke said. Like, I could some big sort of tentpole games you kind of want to see on there, which are going to try and hold on to some of the audience just for Switch who aren't going to jump ship and go out and buy a PlayStation 5 or can't afford to buy a PlayStation 5 and they'll think, great, I can play it now on the Switch. Does this concern any of you in terms of the fact that we've seen The Witcher 3, we've seen The Outer Worlds, we've seen you know, a bunch of big games come to the Switch. We're seeing, hopefully, Doom Eternal still make its way to the Switch. There's been no official cancellation of that. Um, does this concern you that maybe third parties might now sort of no longer consider porting their games properly to the Nintendo Switch and just doing cloud-based streaming. Is there anything that concerns you in the future for this? Anyone? I think if the tech works, it's not it's not a big concern, but we all had those slight issues with control. If you could tweak them, and like you said, if I can move a bit further away from the, the rural side of uh, <laughs> my country... And be sure that everything will work. Then I think I think it can only benefit Nintendo really. Mm. But in 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 lieu of getting physical games, you'd you'd still quite be happy to take that. For example, if if the uh, if if the team developing uh, Doom Eternal said actually we're not going to release this now on a physical cart, but we're only going to do it as cloud-based streaming and charge thirty-five pound. Well, that's that's it, isn't it? Yeah. And we're going to charge thirty-five pound. Is the is the killer you half that then maybe i'm interested mm. interesting well speaking of actually uh, a few games that are coming in terms of uh we're talking about here uh control demo and we're, i'm assuming hitman 3 will also have a demo there was another big demo that came out this week and that was a uh, hyrule warriors age of calamity that also launched straight after the nintendo partnership direct have any of you had a chance to play this yet yep. uh, well who wants to jump in and, and give me their initial thoughts on on this? Mike, we'll go with you. Yeah, I thought it was fun. It's 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 fun. It's Hyrule Warriors. Um, you know, it's got a great art style. There was there's a bit of pop in and a bit of uh, a bit of frame rate drop here and there, but uh, but overall, I enjoyed it. And I'm they've got me hooked a bit with the whole you know Breath of the Wild uh, calamity backstory. So. It's uh, it's hard not to be a little bit excited about it, uh, but the core cool gameplay is fun as well, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, and Luke, what about you? Do you do you think demos are still a relevant marketing strategy? Is, it, is there anything else they can do to entice custom, or is this if is this if you ask me if you'd asked me before this demo, then maybe I would have had a different view on it. Um, it was on my radar. I had the original Hyrule Warriors. Uh, and also, you know, it's a Zelda franchise, so you've always got that level of quality. But I was probably going to leave it and get it in a couple of months. They threw that demo on. I played it for 10 minutes. I was I was sold on it straight away. But for me, it's the... It, 
I call it like the Kingdom Hearts dilemma. I I didn't want to buy the new Kingdom Hearts uh, Melody of Memories rhythm game. That's not really my thing. And then they stuck in the middle of that then five minutes of here's all the story for Kingdom Hearts. You miss out on this. You'll have no idea what's going on when we bring a new title out. And I think Breath of the Wild has done that for me as well. Like I'm, They put enough of the story in the demo that I'm probably going to get it day one now. Age of Calamity. Um, you mean, yeah. Um, Sandy, big Zelda fan, obviously. Um, you know, what did you think to this in terms of the lore from Age of Calamity? Do you, do you think this was a, a great idea for a, for a demo um, to, to put this out there? Definitely. Um, I mean, I don't think a demo was really necessary. I was pretty invested just from the fact that Breath of the Wild left so many little holes about that 100 years ago plot that filling it in with another game just it makes so much sense and Hyrule Warriors <laughs> was a lot of fun back on the Wii U and the 3DS so yeah the demo might have might have been a bit secondary for my own will but I'm sure that it was definitely like 100% a good plan to put that out for people who were maybe sitting on the fence mm. um yeah no can Nintendo I, uh... sorry. Oh, go on. sorry can I interject what's uh a uh, little side note, what did everyone think of uh, the Guardian R2-D2? <laughs> uh, so what Mike's going on there is that in in uh, Age of Calamity, for anyone who hasn't played it, and, and minus slight spoilers, it's a time-travelling companion who's a slight smaller Guardian uh, that follows Link around, allowing him to activate uh, the runes and the, and the Sheikah Slate. Slightly... I, I would say it's not more R2-D2. I, I'd say it's more like the... Um, they knew a little robot that rolls around in Star Wars. Um, BB-8? What's his name? Yeah, that's the one, BB-8. It feels more like a BB-8 than an R2-D2. <laughs> Got a bit of that. Uh, what's, what's the mouse? The bouncers on the moon as well? <laughs> well <laughs> clangers? Clangers, that's a bit. It sounds like a clanger the as well. Mice on the moon. <laughs> mice on the moon. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I actually think it's a... It's an interesting tactic. Um, I think it, it kind of just alluding to what Sandy just said there, it actually um, does help sort of plug those gaps in in terms of the timeline. You know, it's 100 years is a bit, probably a bit much in terms of the aged characters and everything like that. And I think this acts as a conduit to be able to explain that story. Um, are you a fan yourself, Mike? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, we know it's the... Uh... Sorry to bring it back to Star Wars yet again, but it's it's like the Rogue One thing where you know something has happened and you know what's happened is quite bad, but you don't really know how it's gone down. So it's a really it's a good hook, you know. Mm. And, and, well, it's interesting we bring up demos anyway because obviously Nintendo had an interesting demo stance over the last few years or past few decades. Really, we historically have not really seen any demos from Nintendo, and when they do, they tend to do it in an obscure way. You know, from download stations uh, in stores to down DS download play, from timed uh, launches that you can only have like a 30 playthrough on the 3DS. You know, you get 30 times to play it through or 10 times to play it through uh, to launch it up. Um, what's very interesting is that Bravely Default 2, which Nintendo are publishing, by the way, at least here in the West, um, received 20,000 survey results, which changed the game accordingly after the demo. Now... Would you like to see Nintendo do this a bit more often, where they put a demo out, get a consensus, get some people to to talk about it and give them feedback and, and make changes accordingly? Or do we think Nintendo knows best? Luke? Uh, no, I thought, it was a, I thought it was a great idea. Um, even if there's minor details changed, I know that with Bravely Default, they've changed the control and the difficulty, which are quite some major things. But it's just it's just feeling like you had some input in the design of that game, I think. Like, it would certainly um, make me want to buy it if I had made some suggestions that had been listened to. I think that would certainly give me that extra incentive, knowing that I've been I've been listened to and what I've what I've asked is being thought of. Yeah, and and Sandy, what about yourself? In terms of a uh, Nintendo's history of of demoing, do you think the Switch has done this best? And if so, are you? Quite happy with their demo strategy. 
I mean, yeah, I I feel like the Nintendo Switch has probably been the platform I've downloaded the most demos on since PS3, <laughs> something like that. The fact yeah. that they can do these sort of small demos, these little chunks, and have them come in under 100 gigs of game data is... I, th- I think Nintendo is the only company that can viably make demos at the moment. I, I can't say I've seen any other companies manage it. And um, starting with Bravely Second, uh, not Bravely Second, Bravely Default 2, um, like that, that was such an interesting way to approach it, making a demo that's deliberately more difficult than the original game, making <laughs> you play through it multiple times and then getting your feedback and going, okay, yeah, let's update this game to, you know, take some of this fan feedback in. If they do that again, I, I would be very interested. Yeah, it it's interesting because I'm not quite sure Nintendo will put out demos for things like Breath of the Wild 2 or Metroid Prime 4. I, I just can't see them doing it that way. Um, I, I would actually thought there would have been a demo for Pikmin 3. Um, it, it, for me, it seems a bit slow in terms of the conversation out there. For, for a game that's been so heavily requested to get ported, I really hope that Pikmin 3 sells well. Um, but Mike, back in the day, did you ever have demo discs on older consoles, you know, in terms of the PlayStation 1 or even the Dreamcast? Did you, you know, is that something that you actually would play a demo through and then purchase afterwards? Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, there's no better game than like Tony Hawk uh, getting the demo of that on the disc. I mean, I just played that to death. Uh, loved it. Got it. Uh, certainly, I'd say that was probably the period and the era of my demo playing days was like the PS1 and on the front of magazine demo discs, uh, which I, I, I long for a little bit now, but because uh, um, you still have to have some kind of uh, compunction yourself there to download the demo. But mm. I kind of like the idea of having a bit more of a curated, randomized, not sure what you're going to get kind of thing. Um, so I miss those days a little bit. And that's that's a hard thing to do when promoting a game, I'd imagine now as well. Um, because that environment doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it's true, and younger younger listeners and younger gamers probably won't understand that. I think a lot of the time when I was particularly a child, I would actually see a lot of value at those demo discs and seeing them on the shelf. It's four ninety nine for the magazine. You always wanted to buy the magazine anyway, but to have that demo disc in there, holes, it was so worth it. And I, I remember having Amiga Amiga CD thirty two uh, demos as well, Dreamcast demos. Uh, there was a bunch, but Luke, do you, do you happen to have any favourite memories? As I mean, Mike's just brought up Tony Hawk's too. There, oh, sorry, Tony Hawk's even. Is there anything that um, do you remember demoing pretty well back in the day? Yeah, um, there was Roscoe McQueen, who was the firefighter, yeah. firefighter platformer, which I played to death, and um, and probably the biggest would be the Final Fantasy VIII. They they had the dollop mission. And that came. That was a big event. That came in its own magazine with its own disc just for that. <laughs> I always liked that you, like Mike said, you've got such a random thing, and there is that compulsion, and you have to go out there and download the demo. But with those discs, you could find some real gems that you'd never consider before. But mm. yeah, Final Fantasy VIII, the dollop mission. I remember being very excited about that and begging to be taken to the supermarket to get it as soon as possible and sandy what about you have you had any favorite games that you've demoed it's demoed absolutely well and then you've gone out and bought the game it doesn't necessarily have to be retro but it could be more more recent i mean um uh struggling to remember demo discs here i i, I did have quite <laughs> a few most of them were on the ps2 but the one that really stood out to me was um silent hill one's demo packaged with metal gear solid on the ps1 Right. Um, so I'd never heard of Silent Hill really uh, jumped into it was terrified didn't really enjoy it but then say six months later I was just thinking about that disc and I was like right I need to get this game I've got a feeling I'll enjoy this now that I've you know got six months older kids brains are weird okay <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah I picked up Silent Hill and never looked back it's still one of my favourite games yeah, I, I, I do actually have to go back to Luke's point, and I think it was Luke that you said, uh, a curated list. 
uh, or maybe it was you, Mike, actually, um, who said, uh, you know, having that curated list. I remember the Dreamcast demo discs. They were games that, just what you were just saying there, Sandy, are games that I might not necessarily play um, or even thought to uh, to download in these this day and age. Um, but you, you might as well give it a go. It's there. You kind of want to utilize your whole demo disc. And sometimes you do come across some gems. Uh, I don't think you necessarily get that these days. And I think the way that eShop is sort of pushed out to you it's probably not the most intuitive I, I know they've tried to make refinements to it but i don't and i i actually don't have any suggestions as to what they could do to improve that um sort of appearance but at the same time i do i do think demos offer a lot to to people buying games i've played that age of calamity demo and it's actually now forced me just to go and uh, as i told you guys right before we started the stream uh to actually go and buy the game um it's not that i had any doubts about it i was kind of in your camp a little bit luke in terms of i was going to wait six months yeah. and sort of just see if i could grab a deal or something but uh, playing that demo it it really does feel like breath of the wild um one or two mobility uh sort of trap backs you know you can't climb everything for example and you, you know the, there's a few things and limited your move sets there but i do think the combat wise it's so much more developed than hyrule warriors was you've got so many more options of methods of attack uh so definitely a great demo to go through um now we're going to transition over to another topic here which is the cyberpunk delay it's, it's a game that's been delayed you know probably every year now i think it was actually meant to come out this time last year um and then it got delayed until around march then it got delayed again until the summer then it got delayed again until i think just uh, october then it's got delayed again and now i think it is December, but yeah, by the time we film this podcast, it might be just delayed till 2021. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen senior designer Andrei Zawadaski, I'm sorry if I've uh, absolutely murdered that name there, and he put a tweet out uh, earlier this week saying, I understand you're feeling angry, disappointed, and want to voice your opinion about the delay. However, sending death threats to the developers is absolutely unacceptable, and we are people just like you. Following up, uh, Zawadowski shared a screenshot of one of the mildest messages of uh, that some of them have got, and uh, they were far, far worse. Every single one of them is being reported. Now, the individual in the screenshot, not identified in any way, told Zawadowski, I know where you live, bro. Release the game or you're finished. Release Cyberpunk or you and your family will be persecuted. Now, <laughs> I, I do think that people go quite far um, with delays of games the, the communities out there are obviously fervent and they want to get their hands on things but this isn't the way to do it uh luke do you happen to obviously see i mean you probably see a lot of these things happen on twitter anyway uh when you saw that earlier this week what were your thoughts and comments i was i was a bit staggered to be honest that he would have to release a statement that the, the uproar was so large. I, I was expecting there would be some kind of backlash, but to the point where he has to actually make a public comment about it. And I, I do wonder, you know, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the old saying, isn't it? W would you say that to his face? <laughs> it's very easy to be a keyboard warrior and make these rash statements in the heat of the moment, but I, I'm absolutely staggered that it is as a bigger problem that it had to be mentioned. Yeah, and, and Mike, frustration obviously comes out of the fact that this game has been delayed for a, for a year now. Bandai Namco have obviously delayed it at times where it, I think the 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 one point they were delaying it, it was meant to come out the week afterwards. So obviously, you know, this game has been riddled with issues um, from start to finish, which we'll get into uh, in, in a moment. But just talking about the abuse itself, um, can you remember in any other games or any other instances um, where it's been like this as well, and what what are your thoughts on on this particular issue as well? Yeah, it's it's a it's a sad thing to have to be talking about it really because it's it is a thing which has gone on for like quite a long while as well in ever since the internet's been around really. Um, like I distinctly remember when Hideo Kojima said he wasn't going to make Metal Gear Solid Three. Uh, it was actually like death threats which. Uh, encouraged him to come back to the direct directorial helm, um, um, but I'm not saying that's a good thing at all. That's uh, it, it's not, and it's, it, I wish it wasn't. I wish it wasn't a thing that we were talking about now, really. 
Mm. And Sandy, obviously, you probably hear worse of things on a night out in Glasgow or something. But what do you what do you feel to the extremity of these comments? You know, people berating people on the internet anyway. Um, and for a lot of these people, you know, some of these people's addresses have been leaked online before in the past through various leaks and stuff. You know, this is a very real issue. We saw, uh, for example, Boogie, um, a YouTuber, someone approached him on his doorstep, harassing him. Um, you know, these things can call very, cause very real world incidents and, and very real world life ramifications. Um, what do you think to those those comments that have been aimed at cyberpunk devs oh um i think there should be complete zero tolerance for people who feel they need to threaten developers or creatives or companies um i mean all we need to do to look back and feel worried is think about kyoto animation who um were burnt to the ground literally um just last year or the year before, I think it was last year, um, all because someone sent them death threats and it was treated as, this is a death threat, send it to the police. And the guy just went ham. <laughs> mm. So from Cyberpunk's it, perspective, it must be very concerning. Yeah. I, and uh, I think all of us can agree, it's abhorrent behaviour really, and it shouldn't be tolerated. And, and you know, there is an element that Twitter and the police should probably get involved in this. This is, while maybe a, something made in passing, and it might be an isolated incident, there might be a few obviously stronger worded ones. Uh, we know that obviously uh, there, there will be, people will definitely berate these people, and I do think authorities should get involved. But I, I don't think that's necessarily the only problem that is facing a lot of the devs um, uh, that are in the world at the moment. You know, for example, CD Projekt Red, uh, you know, Jason Schreier has reported at least one cyberpunk dev has recently mentioned working an, a 100 hour week. Um, and, you know, and they've been described as looking physically ill from the mandatory overtime caused by the game's multiple delays. Um, these developers, uh, Shri Jason Schreier says, learned of Wednesday's three week delay in an email that went out simultaneously with the company's public statement on Twitter. So, <laughs> You know, it's, it's crunch time at, at the developers. You know, it's crunch time part and parcel of working as a games developer. Um, Luke, do you think that, you know, that, that suffer, that, that backlash on decisions made by uh, members, you know, by the higher end of the company should be then suffered by those and below? I find it hard to understand how the developers got that email the same day as we all heard about this. Surely the higher up people should be taking their lead from the guys who are making it and then adjusting accordingly. Um, I do think that with any job, uh, that which I'm sure we've all experienced, we have to put those extra hours in. But, um, yeah. Well, we're this going is there, a... Neil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, is, uh, <laughs> that is Zawaski just coming to thank yeah, you. They're coming thank to... us all for his uh, reviews. Uh -huh. No, I mean, I think what you're saying is correct in terms of um, surely the developers should have known this, right? Because uh, they're the ones making the game, so surely they know it's not finished or not ready yet. Uh, and and a delay is actually probably a good thing. You want the game to be right. They've they've delayed it this long. You know, what's another three weeks? What's another year? Um, I mean, Miyamoto in it. It's that famous quote. What is it? A a uh, delayed game will eventually be good, but a bad game will always be bad. Um, yep. You know, it's one of the best best quotes in the games industry, I think. <laughs> yeah, Sandy, have you ever felt that a lot of the developers and a lot of uh, a lot of places with crunch has that been an issue before in the past? Is it is it still an issue that's rife now, and is it more that people have got their own individual platforms that we hear more of it? Um, I mean, I would be hard pressed to be persuaded that it's never that it wasn't a problem in the past um but certainly with all the sort of social media um platforms there's a lot more publicity of crunch and how bad it is for people um it's almost like a a super version of whatever we all go through when like an important deadline's coming up or something like that I mean, I think it was 
Rockstar Games had a big thing about crunch recently. And to be honest, I would much rather they just said, right, instead of having crunch time, let's delay this game for however many months the devs need to actually get it finished without killing themselves to get it done. Um, but I understand that that's not always going to be possible as well. Yeah, the, the issue with, I think that was Red Dead Redemption too. There were a lot of people who left during a project and then had their name removed from the credits. Uh, you know, it did seem very sour over at Rockstar. And, you know, it's, it's, with Cyberpunk, you know, that game is so close to completion. Luke, uh, is this still part and parcel, right? Is, is this something that, as a games developer, that you should expect to do when it comes to, you know, the bottom line, the 11th hour, you should be working long ass weeks? I think, I think there's a level. And I think a hundred hour week is far above that level of expectancy. I I do agree that everyone has to crunch in their occupation at some point, but I feel that this many hours and with this little notice, I think they should have known this well in advance and said, look, we can schedule this in, we'll project manage it. You will have to do extra hours, but We'll set a release date, I don't know, quarter one of next year, and we'll add, I don't know, at most 10 hours to your work week just to ensure that everyone still works happily. I think it's, yeah, although by cr- by definition, the word crunch, isn't it? That is what they're doing, I guess. <laughs> and Mike, do you think there's a, do you think that sales could be affected by this? Do you think that? people are getting tired of this the boat might have the ship might have sailed you know we're going into the next generation where people who have owning playstation 5s and xbox series x's are, are buying the next gen games they're now they've moved on is, is do you think this delay is could be a nail in the coffin for them i mean i've seen people talking about them cancelling pre-orders because of it um so i guess that's a direct uh, impact on their sales um but at the end of the day if the reviews are good if the game is good i mean it's it's a hotly anticipated game mm. um for a lot of people i think i think for a lot of people the end justifies the means sadly um and if it's if it's good and it's getting that publicity constantly positive publicity after the release people will very quickly forget about the how it got there you know i don't i don't see many japanese uh devs and and people in development teams and in various japanese studios ever really sort of complain of crunch do you think that's more owing to the society of that they're probably not as outspoken as perhaps guys in development studios in the us or or europe sandy do you think um that there's any game that's worth mandatory over time i can imagine there's a bunch of nintendo or sony uh, Konami and Capcom and Bandai Namco games that probably also suffer the same sort of crunch period, but we just don't necessarily hear about it. Um, what are your thoughts? Should there should there be mandatory overtime and and get those people working on those games? I think so long as the mandatory overtime period has been agreed at the start of development and the developers know it's coming, mm. that might be okay. But I think it's this idea that. Uh, in game development we always have a crunch and just that expectation that crunch time will be there it's maybe just something that's become like a bad habit of the industry maybe Mm. Uh, fair enough well that's all we've got to talk about in terms of uh, cyberpunk delays however we do have one more crunch to talk about and that's Crunchyroll Uh, (laughs) the Crunchyroll purchase um, by Sony um, one billion dollars as i should probably be this as i say that is that is that a bit too much is anyone a big crunchy roll user here sandy i think you might be um you know you're an active user i'm assuming uh what does this mean to you um i mean my hope would be that this sort of new management coming in um this new oversight like overall company um would give Crunchyroll a chance to sort of fix a couple of issues that have snuck into its systems recently. Um, I I feel like this sale 
is probably going to be a good thing for the service. One billion pounds or dollars is actually okay. I, I feel like it, it it's suitable given that Crunchyroll are um, essentially publishing some stuff by themselves these days and sort of doing that simulcasting where they're subtitling anime as it comes out in Japan uh, and letting uh, their premium members watch it and stuff. Mm. Luke, big anime fan, one billion dollar acquisition by Sony, does that excite you? Um, do you think that this will bring additional content to the platform? Um, yeah, there's certain anime that I'm a, I'm a massive fan on, and I would certainly be interested in using Crunchyroll. As, as Sandy said, with the new management coming in, I've, I found it very hard to get to grips with in terms of using it as a free service. I think in terms of a free service to it, it's pretty much unusual. Unusual. Unusable. <laughs> it, it is very unusual that you would put an ad in the middle of something every three minutes for a 20 minute program. But um, yeah, let's see what the subscription model looks like and let's see, as Sandy said, if they make those changes that it sounds like they sorely need. And then, yeah, I might be interested. Yeah. Now, Mike, $1 billion purchase of Crunchyroll by Sony. Yeah, this seem very hyped up about this. Are you as excited? Um. <sighs> I don't, it seems like a lot of money to me. Uh, um, I'm not the most educated on uh, anime, you know. I, I enjoy Akira. I like uh, I remember watching like Third Eye Blind back in the day and stuff. But uh, but I'm not super educated on it at all. Um, mm. So it seems like a lot to me, which what for what I would have imagined is quite a niche market thing. But then I think it's also in. Uh, indicative of sort of value of streaming now you know and that that is reflected in the price um you know so it's a sign of the times i think yeah i it is interesting anime does seem to be taking uh taking off a little bit more in the west netflix reported that you know they've had an increased watch or viewership of anime in the last week as well so it's it's almost like netflix has helped support sony's decision there which is very interesting uh to put that out but I, I do think any platform that helps anime, uh, you know, people view that content, whether that be now that Sony are able to promote that in a better way or, or bring it to more eyes. I mean, I, I guarantee there's still people out there who had never heard of Crunchyroll that that mm-hmm. like anime or are aware of anime. I think I think it'd be strange if they hadn't. But hey, look, there's there's new market for everything, and I do think Sony, with the powerhouse that they are as a media company, will be able to bring some credence behind Crunchyroll and. And like Sandy says, that management, the new management structure will surely have an advertising and marketing team to get it out there to, to new people. Maybe make it part of PlayStation Plus or or PlayStation Network or, or whatever they decide to do. Um, there could be realms of opportunities there in terms of making that media application on default on Sony Bravia TVs and, and many others. So a long future to come for anime. <laughs> Okay, and, and just as we round off this uh, this episode of Glass to the Wall, episode 91, uh, let's just go around the table and see what everybody is playing right now. Um, Sandy, why don't we start with you? I am playing Animal Crossing. Animal uh, Crossing, back to Animal Crossing. Uh, you, you delved into the Halloween side of things. I did indeed. I grew a ton of pumpkins and I dressed my character up as an imp and then I had to go around my town and undo that all today because Halloween's finally over. <laughs> Fair enough. And and Luke, what about yourself? Have you been playing anything entertaining? I'm playing Watch Dogs Legion at the moment. Yeah. Review coming soon. Definitely. And you've been Review playing that on the you've been playing that on the channel as well, right? Um, yes. Through Let's Plays. Are you still planning to do more uh, let play Let's Play streams? Yeah, definitely. Um, probably definitely going to stream some Watch Dogs again next week. Uh, maybe stick with Gabrielle if you've watched it. She seems to be our most valuable player at the moment, so <laughs> we'll stick with her, do all the missions with her, I think. Cool. And Mike, yourself, you've been gaming this week? If so, what have you been playing? Uh, yeah, I'm still playing Final Fantasy XV, but uh, the other day, to uh, you know, to celebrate the uh, festive, festive Halloween season, uh, I started Alan Wake. Uh, so I've never played Alan Wake, so I'm giving that a go. And yep, it's a remedy. Nice. And uh, I've actually been playing a bit of FIFA 
believe it or not. Um, just, you know, as renewed interest in Aston Villa has uh, gone up in my book, uh, not the last two weeks, but, um, you know, I've decided to want to get my teeth into a football game, so why not? Um, but I've also been playing a bit um, of Hyrule Warriors, the original Hyrule Warriors. I just want to get myself psyched up for uh, Age of Calamity coming up as well. So um, there's a few other things I'm playing, but I can't talk about them. Um, but we will be talking about them in the coming weeks. Uh, episode 92 of Glass of the Wall will be coming out hopefully next week. <laughs> Let's see if we can all reunite. Um, but guys, do you have any closing comments about anything that we've talked about today? Uh, anyone got anything else to say? Four hour work week. Four, no, four day work week. Four day work week, okay. Actually, four hour will be better. Yeah, yeah four hour. <laughs> Shout out to the uh, CD <laughs> Project team. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, then, guys. Well, if you all want to say your handles, your Twitter handles, just before we uh, depart today, Luke? Uh, it's at Lem207. Mike? going to do this to me every week. I'm going to have to me memorize it. <laughs> I believe yours is movement matter. Movement matter with no ease. <laughs> no ease, yeah. No ease in Wales. And uh, Sandy? I'm at Squidgy Buffalo. Brilliant. And I'm at Flynn Neal. Okay, guys. Well, this has been episode 91 of Glass to the Wall. We hope that you've enjoyed everything that you've seen today. This is, if this is your first time on our channel, please subscribe. Go over to our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Cube3 channels. Um, please use the links in the description below. But for now, this is everything. Take care, everybody. Bye.